Hey, it's Marvin McKenzie again. I'm pastor of Bible Baptist Church in Puyallup, Washington. And I want to do a little bit of a lesson on Baptist church history today. This is actually going to be the fourth of the of the lessons that uh, that I've done on Baptist church history. I wrote a book uh, years a couple of years ago called Roots Matter of Baptists interpretation on church history. And, you know, just like uh, any kind of history, history is always, uh, it's almost a, an art form. Uh, the interpretation the study of history is almost more of an art form than a science. Uh, now, I know uh, many academics, uh, historians wouldn't want to say it that way, but the fact of the matter, it really is. It's a, it's kind of a, uh, a work in progress. They take a look at, at evidence that's, that, that exists. They look at documents that exist and archaeological evidence, and then they try to put together what they think is a plausible explanation of what all this evidence uh, suggests might have happened at a time in history that we aren't uh, privy to, that we're not a part of. And so they write out this history, they put it together in, in history books, and they call themselves authorities. And, you know, um, uh, church history is has been subject to the same sorts of biases that all history is subject to, and the Catholics have had their biases of church history, and um, and and in, for the most part, really, the Catholic uh, Catholic uh, um, concept of church history is really the predominant one. Uh, even the Protestants and and almost everyone who'd claim to be a Christian today would accept what the Catholics say uh, happened as church history early on uh, in 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 the life of Christianity, and and Baptists, the people who would claim we Baptists who would claim that no, there is a history, a church history that exists outside of Catholicism, outside of the Reformation, and outside of of uh, of uh, outside of Catholicism, outside of the Reformation, uh, and uh, outside of Protestantism. They'd say, "Man, you guys are radicals, and you're not academic, and you're not thinking. You don't know what you're talking about." And uh, the fact is, there's plenty. Of, uh, there is plenty of evidence out there that there were there were always believers, Christians who refused to align with Catholicism and were never needed to, to reform and never needed to cut protest out of Catholicism because they never were a part of it in the first place. Always were some people like that in existence in, uh, in throughout history and that they were the, our, our Anabaptist forefathers and then we as Baptists uh, 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 follow in, in their in their line and their in their family. So we've been looking at some things in the last, this is the third of a kind of a series that I'm trying to do right now. I guess this is the fourth lesson, third in a, in a series on on how um, uh, God God's word uses um Husbandry, the idea of gardening, planting and watering and sowing seeds, um, and to 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 picture not really Christian growth but church growth. How the churches are going to work, and and so we've, we've narrowed down into specific passages of scripture in Matthew chapter thirteen, and in Matthew thirteen there are three specific parables that that matter for us, and the first one is the parable of the sower, and the sower goes out and he throws the seed, and some falls on the wayside, and some on stony ground, some on thorn ground, some falls in the good ground, and it produces fruit, and um and and it gives us this 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 picture there, and so there's some that falls on the wayside, the Birds come and they eat it up and some falls in the stony ground and it just, you know, the sun with it doesn't get any root it's sun and it withers. And then some in the thorny ground and it, and it, and springs to life. But, but then the, the weeds and the cares of this world choke out the life in it. And, uh, so it's given us that, that parable. And then another parable is found, uh, in that very same chapter 13 is the parable of the wheat and the tares where the Bible says God's got this garden and then an enemy comes and he sows in a, a, a bad seed. He sows those in a wild seed. And, and so the question is, well, what are we going to do about this wild seed? And the master says, well, just let it alone. Comes time for the harvest. We'll take care of it. If you mess with it early, if you mess with it too soon, it's going to, it'll ruin a uh, good seed as well as bad. And so just leave it alone and, and God will take care of it uh, in his day and, and in his harvest. And then finally, there is the third of these, these three um, parables that really kind of relate to what uh, church history and what goes on in church history where God says it's like a mustard seed it's planted and it grows into a, a a huge huge tree that um that the birds of the air can find lodging in there right away we have some problems when we when we read this because mustard seeds don't grow into trees a mustard seed that grows into a tree is an abomination is a monster it's an aberration it's not what's supposed to happen 
And so what we've got in this in this illustration, a lot of times people talk about that parable, you know, but growing in and, and they'll say, well, that's what happened with Christianity. It started out with something very little and turned into something huge and wonderful and mighty and provide shade and all of this kind of stuff. No, it's an aberration is what he's describing here. He says, this is something that's going to grow up into, into a monstrosity. And that's that's what he's describing in this passage of scripture. He says it becomes a, a haven of birds. And, and, and I'll remind you, I just mentioned this a second ago in the first parable, the parable of sowers, um, the seed is thrown on the wayside and it's the birds of the air that come and gobble up and steal the fruit and steal the seed. And and so what we're seeing here is something that is devouring the word of God and stealing it from the sower. And all of this points to, to the fact that the roots of the church, both True churches and false churches date all the way back to the church century to the first century, not the church century, but the first century that not all claims to Christianity is of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everything that says it's a church is a church. Not everything that says it belongs to Christ belongs to Christ. Not everything that says it uh, it was started by Christ was started by Christ. And not all that is old is spiritual. Catholicism goes back to the first century. I, I know it's really the fourth century before Catholicism as we know it exists, but really the very first century, there are already seeds of what's going to happen there already in the first century. There are two sorts of roots of churches today. There is one that is um, a deep tap root, and there is another that is like a spreading root wad. One has produced a, a delicate herb that is a blessing to those who find it. And the other is a monstrous tree that is not at all what God intended it to be. The roots of a church matter. And I want to take some time over the next, um, I don't know, several weeks probably, bringing some of these um, these episodes on a, to just con- discuss uh, the roots of the church and where churches come from and what kind of churches uh, are, uh, could can rightfully say that they are the church of the living God and what churches really are a monster. I'm Marvin McKenzie. I'm the pastor of Bible Baptist Church in Puyallup, Washington. You can find us on the web at www.puyallupbaptistchurch.com. I want to thank you for watching this today.